and or ma'am. Corporal H.R. Funk, reporting for duty. Hi folks, H.R. Funk here. Once again in my version of a throwback uniform. No, I'm not still in the Marine Corps. I've been out for a long, long time. But since today's video is going to feature a discussion about the history of military battle rifles, and since every Marine is first and foremost a rifleman, and rifle marksmanship has been described as the holy grail of the Marine Corps, I thought maybe my uniform was appropriate to the occasion. In any regard, what I'm going to be talking about today is the military's transition from the M1 battle rifle to the M14 circa 1957. And by the end of the video, I hope to be able to answer the question as to whether or not that decision in 1957 was a good one. So here we go. The idea for my video today came from a discussion I had at the national matches at Camp Perry last summer with another former Marine. In fact, he was in the Marine Corps in the early 1960s when the switch was made from the M1 battle rifle to the M14. And what he was telling me during our discussion was that he really preferred the M1 to the M14. Now this was a very timely discussion because I've been doing a lot of research lately on the M14 rifle, its history, its development, and its ultimate implementation into our military. And usually what comes out of any discussion of the M14 is basically an idea that it was a colossal foul up. And when you look at its service life, which really only went from about 1960 when the manufacturing really got into high gear until about 1963, 1964 or so, and the rifle only served as our official battle rifle up until about 1965. Now technically, it was still the official battle rifle beyond that because of an agreement with NATO that the 7.62 cartridge was going to be the NATO standard and all of the countries who were members of NATO were going to have primary battle rifles that used that particular cartridge. However, in 1965, the United States adopted the M16 rifle, which of course did not fire the 7.62 NATO cartridge, and that, at least in function, became our official battle rifle, if not officially on paper until some years later. So why would the United States adopt a rifle that's only going to serve for a very short period of time? Well, one of the things that I think happens when we discuss the M14 rifle, and this happens with a lot of things that are discussed in a historical context, is that we look at it from a 2020 hindsight, and we recognize all of the things that happened since that period of time that influenced whatever changes were made. However, all those things that happened since that time were not known at the time of the ultimate adoption, in this case of the M14 rifle. The M14 came from a number of experiments and test rifles that had been developed all the way back into World War II. And we can't really start a discussion of the M14 without first discussing its predecessor, the M1 battle rifle, and some of the shortcomings that were perceived with regard to that design. So here is our trusty M1. Now some of you may know the history of this rifle. John C. Garand was hired by the Springfield Armory in 1919, and very shortly thereafter he began design work on the rifle that would bear his name. That design and development continued through the 1920s up into the 1930s, and in 1936 the M1 was adopted as the official battle rifle of the United States military. At the time of its adoption, the M1 rifle technologically was head and shoulders over virtually any other military organization's rifles that were issued in the world. Most of the military organizations at that time were using some version of a manually operated rifle, be it bolt action, straight pull, maybe even some lever actions floating around out there. But the United States had a semi-automatic gas-operated rifle that could fire eight rounds as fast as the shooter could pull the trigger. And then it automatically ejected the eight-round M-block clip, and a fresh clip could be loaded into the rifle, and shooting could recommence. I would say there is little debate among World War II historians that the M1 battle rifle in the hands of United States soldiers and Marines helped the Allies win World War II. So that being the case, what could be perceived as a deficiency in the design of the M1? 
Actually, there were three things that came to light during the war with regard to perceived inadequacies of the M1. First and foremost was the capacity. The M1, via its N-block clip, was limited to eight cartridges that could be loaded into the rifle at any time. This was something that the troops on the front line desired as a change. They wanted something that would hold more ammunition so they could fire more shots between reloads. Preferably, something with a detachable box magazine. Now, part of the reason for that was, in order to top off the end block clip of the M1, and I have a video on that uh, if you haven't seen it, is a somewhat tedious process if you fired two or three rounds out of the end block clip and you want to load more rounds into there. Now you can eject the entire clip and replace it with a fresh, full eight, eight round in block clip. But if you want to just single load some rounds in there, it is a little bit more of a time consuming process. Whereas a detachable box magazine makes that process of topping off the magazine very easy. So higher capacity, detachable box magazine, and the other function or the other feature that the troops wanted in their battle rifle was full auto capability. Now there were several attempts on the part of armorers who were deployed in theater to add some of those features to existing M1s in the field. And there were actually some armorers who installed BAR magazines in the M1 rifle in an attempt to meet those desires of the troops. Those ideas were transmitted back to Springfield Armory, and at that point, John Garand and his contemporaries went to work on the M1 design to see if they could incorporate some of those desired features into the M1. Modifications to the basic design of the M1 rifle progressed through many different test and evaluation and prototype phases, but really most of the money that was being spent during that time was being channeled toward manufacturing new M1 rifles and getting them to the troops in the field and not so much toward modifying or potentially replacing the existing M1 rifle. For that reason, by the end of the war, the M1 still existed in pretty much the same exact format as it had when the war began. Now in the years following World War II, the Soviet Union adopted the AK-47 rifle. This was something that caught the attention of the powers in the military that existed in the United States at that time. The AK-47 is a true assault rifle, and it followed the lines of the STG-44 that the Germans had designed late in World War II. The idea with the assault rifle was to take the full-size battle rifle cartridge, shorten it to a shorter and somewhat less powerful cartridge, and then chamber it in a smaller, lighter firearm that could be fired in fully automatic mode. With the adoption of the AK-47 assault rifle by the Soviet Union, the United States finally started to take a good hard look at the M1 and tried to determine if there was a way to modify it to follow the assault rifle format, or maybe even if it should be replaced, in favor of something else that was going to be more contemporary. Now there was an experimental rifle cartridge that had been developed years earlier, in fact back during World War II, known as the T-65. And although it was based on the 300 Savage cartridge, it was essentially a shortened version of the 30 6 battle rifle cartridge used by the M1. The T-65 eventually was developed into what we know today as the 762 NATO, or in its civilian form, it is the 308 Winchester. Now if I hold the 7.62 NATO cartridge side by side with the 30-06 battle rifle cartridge, we can see it is significantly shorter and it would allow designers to chamber it in a rifle with a shorter and lighter receiver. However, the 7.62 NATO cartridge generates nearly the same power as the 30-06 cartridge. So thereby, it also generates nearly as much recoil as the 30-06 cartridge, and that was really the Achilles heel to this particular cartridge, and something that later on plagued the M14. Now this is the point in the story where I think a significant mistake was made. Instead of looking at replacing the M1 with a new design that actually followed the assault rifle format, 
the United States instead continued developing and modifying what was essentially the M1 action or the M1 design. There was an upstart company that came along called Armalite that developed a radically new firearm design for the time and it was something that chambered the T65-762 NATO cartridge and followed the assault rifle platform and it did a lot of the things that the military was looking to do but it was so radically different at the time that it wasn't even really seriously considered. It was looked at as a toy, it was looked at as a piece of junk and basically just dismissed from consideration. Now in defense of the military decision makers of the time I've got to remind everyone, as I said a little while ago, the United States just a few years earlier had helped win World War II using the M1 battle rifle. At this point in the story, we're engaged in military operations in Korea, and again, M1 rifles are being manufactured and purchased and sent to the troops on the Korean Peninsula for that conflict, and again, it is continuing to give good service to our troops. Also, in the mind of a lot of people in the military in those days, the era of small arms being used in military conflicts was drawing to an end. When the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan at the end of World War II, a new era in warfare had come into being, and most of the people higher up in the military and in the government believed that military conflicts moving into the future would hinge largely on nuclear capabilities. After all, if you can drop a nuclear weapon on an enemy's position, why would you need small arms? What good would that do? It would be a little bit like spending money to manufacture swords after the machine gun had been developed and implemented. However, what people didn't think about and maybe didn't fully understand until years later was the literal fallout associated with the use of nuclear weapons. Nowadays, we recognize that. We recognize the reluctance to use those type of weapons, if at all possible. So the conventional small arms continued to play a vital role. But again, in the early 1950s, I don't think that was clearly understood. I think the full expectation was that moving forward, any type of military small arms were going to have a relatively limited use in military operations. So along the lines of what I was just saying, the United States military desired the small arm that was going to be used moving into the future in that limited role that they were expecting would replace an entire class or several different small arms that were at that time in use. They wanted something that would replace the M1 battle rifle, it would replace the M1 and M2 30 carbine, it would replace the Thompson submachine gun, and it would replace possibly even the 1911A1 pistol. They really wanted a one firearm for all purpose type of a weapon that they could issue to the troops and one type of ammunition that they would have to inventory for that weapon for the role that they would see it being used in in the future. Now unfortunately the M1 rifle didn't really lend itself to modification to that point. Again Really, the Armalite AR-10 probably came much closer to that all-around firearm that the United States was looking to develop than the M1 action or eventually the M14 ever could. Now, what's not known to a lot of people is the fact that the T-48 rifle, which most of the free world knows as the FN-FAL, was very nearly adopted by the United States as the standard battle rifle. It came within one test. In fact, it was all but assured the FNFAL was going to become our battle rifle until one test halted that and then continued the further development of the rifle that eventually became the M14. But because of the T-48's failure in that one test, and if memory serves, it was an Arctic weather test conducted in Alaska, where the FAL performed poorly, that gave Springfield Armory and the Ordnance Corps time to further modify an experimental rifle that they had been developing for some years at that point, known as the T-44. The T-44 was essentially a slightly shortened M1-style action with a modified gas system, 
A shortened barrel length, although with the addition of a flash hider, the overall length was greater than the M1. And this was the rifle that the Armory had been developing for many, many years. It was the end result of all of the prototypes and all of the development that began back during World War II on the M1 rifle's action. Ultimately, in 1957, the decision was made to adopt the T-44 rifle as the military's new M14 battle rifle. And as you can see, it bears a striking resemblance to its parent, the M1 Garand. Now the M14 was supposed to be a shorter, lighter rifle than the M1. And in terms of weight, it's difficult to get a good firm weight on these rifles, and I think that's largely because of fluctuations in the weight of the wood stock. But the M1 rifle is about a 10.5 or 11 pound rifle. The M14 is about a 9.5 to 10 pound rifle. So somewhere between a half a pound and a pound was shaved off the weight of the M1 in the development of the M14. In terms of overall length, the M14 is actually slightly longer by about half an inch. And if I take both of my rifles and put them on the floor side by side, you can actually see, well maybe you can't see, <laughs> that the M14 is maybe half an inch longer, maybe not quite longer than the M1. Now mainly that's because of the flash suppressor. The actual barrel length of the M14 is about two inches less than the M1, but with the addition of the flash suppressor that adds some overall length, and again it ends up being about a half inch longer than the M1. Now you may be asking yourself, if the flash suppressor adds overall length to the M14, why didn't they just delete it from the design? The reason is because the flash suppressor also aids with the recoil, or at least the muzzle rise of the rifle. And keep in mind, the M14 was developed with fully automatic firing capabilities. Now if you notice, the bottom of the flash suppressor is closed off. What that means is escaping gases behind the bullet vent to the sides and through the top of the flash suppressor to help keep that muzzle from rising, especially during rapid fire or fully automatic firing of the rifle. There was a lot of development that was put into the M14's flash suppressor and there were a lot of prototypes and a lot of different designs that were tried and this was the one that was ultimately adopted and it really needs to be on there, or at least needed to be on there, in order to help with that recoil from the rifle. Now keep in mind, as I said a while ago, the T65 cartridge that was developed into the 7.62 millimeter NATO cartridge has about the same recoil impulse as the full power 30-06 battle rifle cartridge. So again, the assault rifle concept was not really brought to fruition with the M14. This was really just a modernized version of the battle rifle that had been the M1, but even though it was an attempt at building an assault rifle, or at least something that moved toward the assault rifle format for the United States, the M14 really didn't get that job done. Part of the reason I say that is because a true assault rifle can be fired controllably in fully automatic or at very least burst automatic fire, three round burst, four round burst, whatever. And because of the recoil impulse of the M14, it was never controllable in that fully automatic firing mode. In fact, eventually, a lot of the selector levers that would allow for transition to the full auto mode in the M14 rifle were welded permanently in the semi-automatic position because the rifle was just never controllable in that fully automatic firing mode. Now the M14 design did succeed in implementing the use of a detachable box magazine, which as you recall was identified as a desirable feature all the way back into the days of World War II. However, when you look at the M14 and where that magazine is, you can see right away it has an influence on where the shooter is able to hold the rifle. And this is one of the complaints that my friend that I was talking to at Camp Perry had when he was talking about the M14. He couldn't hold on to it where he was used to with the M1. 
and if you wanted to try to rest it on something to shoot over it, that magazine was always kind of in the way. Now some of that, I have no doubt, is a result of his familiarity with the M1. That was what he was originally issued. That's what he was trained on. He was used to holding it where he held it. He was used to being able to rest it on things the way he wanted to rest it. And the M14 just didn't allow him to do those things anymore. Winding back the clock momentarily to the M1, we can see that since there's no magazine protruding from the bottom of the stock, there's no problem for shooters of varying statures or varying arm lengths to be able to grasp the rifle wherever it works best for them, and there's nothing to impede the rifle from being rested on anything or in any position if you're shooting over top of something or even around something for that matter. In terms of weight, as I said before, the M14 is half a pound to a pound lighter than the M1, but when we include the weight of the fully loaded detachable box magazine, which holds 20 rounds of ammunition, all of a sudden that slight advantage of the lighter weight of the M14 dissipates. Let's take a look at just how much this weighs. And here we have our fully loaded M14 magazine on the official Cabela's scale and it's weighing in well over a pound and a half, about a pound and three quarters. So we can see that that pretty much negates any weight advantage the M14 has over the M1. Just out of curiosity, I put 20 rounds worth of M1 ammunition on the official Cabela's scale and it's weighing in under a pound and a half. So even when it comes to carrying ammunition, it would have been lighter to carry the same amount of ammunition with the M1, at least loaded for or prepared for loading in the M1 rifle, than it would have been to carry fully loaded magazines for the M14. So in the end, when the M14 was officially adopted, our troops ended up with a rifle that was longer, heavier when fully loaded, and still not capable of being fired controllably in fully automatic fire modes. It did have the advantage of a detachable box magazine, but as we've discussed, that came at the cost of some of the rifle's ergonomics, or at least some of the M1's ergonomics, with regard to how the troops could hold the rifle and rest it if necessary. So when you consider all of that, how could you not say the adoption of the M14 rifle in 1957 was a mistake? Well, let's discuss that for a minute. You may recall at the beginning of the video, I said that we had to discipline ourselves to look at the transition from the M1 to the M14 from the perspective of the people who were making the decisions at the time, not from our perspective of looking back and knowing everything that happened in the aftermath. The alternative to adopting the M14 rifle would have been to continue to issue and produce the M1 rifle, which by the late 1950s, much as it had been cutting edge in the 1930s was becoming very quickly obsolete. I don't think the idea of continuing to arm our troops with an obsolete rifle would be one that most people would think was a good idea. So when they had the option of the M14, which was at very least a product improved M1, or continuing with the M1, I think the only logical choice could have been to transition to the M14 at that time. Now you could argue all the blunders in the past that maybe the FNFAL should have actually been adopted as opposed to the M14, or maybe I should say the T48 should have been adopted as opposed to the T44. And you could also argue that the Armalite rifle should have been looked at more seriously and maybe evaluated and tested and developed. And from my perspective, I think that would have been the best choice to make, but it was not the choice made. The choice that was made was to continue with the rifle design that essentially had helped the Allies win World War II and develop that into a newer, more modernized version, which is exactly what we ended up with with the M14. So as we now know from history, the M14 was plagued with problems. It was plagued with production problems to begin with. In fact, full-scale manufacture of this rifle didn't really get into high gear until about 1960 or so and then was stopped in about the 1963-1964 time frame. And when you consider that, along with the fact that replacement of this rifle began in 1965, we end up with an official battle rifle for the United States military with the absolute shortest service life. 
That, coupled with some of the difficulties that were encountered with the M14 when the troops went to Vietnam and started to use this in that country, problems associated with the weight, problems associated with the bulkiness of the ammunition and the weight of the ammunition, which reduced the amount that could be carried, the fact that it was really overpowered for that conflict, and the range capability of the M14 wasn't really necessary in jungle warfare where you were almost at what we would now call across the room distances or across the yard distances. A cartridge that's capable of launching a bullet seven or 800 yards really isn't necessary when you're shooting somebody 30 or 40 feet away. Also the uncontrollability of this rifle in full auto fire. And I was just talking or emailing back and forth with another veteran of Vietnam a couple of days ago and he was talking about the ability to fire back at the enemy when they were being engaged with full auto fire of the AK-47. And when your rifle that you're firing back with is not controllable and you're spraying your bullets over the head of the troops that are firing at you, it's not doing you any good. You need something that is controllable in that type of a situation so that you can put accurate shots on target and try to get yourself out of that type of a conflict. <laughs> Folks, before I go, I wanted to let you know if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. The U.S. Rifle M14 from John Garand to the M21 by Blake Stevens. This is from Collector Grade Publications. This book is no longer in print. You have to get it from Amazon from their used books, and it's not inexpensive. I think I paid $80 or so for this book, but it is a wealth of information on this topic going all the way back to some of the things I was discussing taking place during World War II and before, all the way up through the development of the M21 sniper system. Again, very good book. So it's 1957. Ike just started his second term as president. Chevrolet came out with one of its most iconic models, and the United States military adopted a brand new battle rifle. Was that a good decision? Truthfully, I think it's about the best decision they could have made at the time. Now you could argue that there were decisions predating that that could have been different and had a great influence on the development of this rifle or what ultimately replaced the M1 Garand. But at the time, I think the adoption of the M14, as brief as it was, was the best decision that can be made. That's my thoughts on the matter. I'd like to hear yours. If you have any questions or comments, and especially if you were someone that lived through that transition from the M1 to the M14, I'd like to hear from you. Other than that, until next time, good shooting. Bye-bye.